The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. This morning's message, uh, a lot of it's testimony, but it's called the signs of the times. And it's not just a message, it's actually indicative of what I feel God's doing. So I want you to pay close attention because I really believe we're on the, we're on the verge of something wonderful in the spirit. Uh, in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, there's a scripture about the sons of Issachar. If you're familiar with the sons of Issachar, they were knowledgeable about the signs of the times. Various tribes in Israel, but Issachar were those who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. This is just a small portion of scripture, but it depicts a a particular attribute, and that the sons of Issachar had a discernment and particularly about the times, the seasons, what Israel ought to do, the course of action. And what's interesting about this is that I believe that God has given us some indications of the times that we're in, and it's kind of exciting times for us. Uh, and I want to cover that. Um, two and a half years and you people are familiar with it that have been here that long God has given us Isaiah 22 22 he says I'm opening a door when no man can shut and we did traveling ministry for 12 years throughout uh, New England and other areas and God said plant a church here which is walking distance from my house plant a ch church he, by the way he was saying you're going to relocate so I'm going to Tennessee, Florida, New England, relocate. I pull out of our apartment complex, and there's a, this building's for lease, and he goes, there's your relocation. And I go, oh, that figures. This is bailiwick. Bailiwick is something that God sent us to, which means your jurisdiction, your neck of the woods, your territory, your, your turf, <laughs> as, so to speak. A bailiwick is a, a magistrate in England would be in charge of a bailiwick. He'd be called a bailiff. Um, but anyway, saying all this is that we were looking for where we were going to live when we were doing traveling ministry, mostly in the north. And Jennifer was on the internet and she says, well, here's one subdivision we haven't seen. It's called Bailiwick. And the power of God flooded the room. And I said, that's where we're going to live. We, I, we didn't see the we didn't even see it, sight unseen. That's it. That's where we're going to live. We pull in, and just that's a story in itself. It's just a divine appointment. We just happened to meet the builder standing in the front before he turned it over to a real estate. And basically, we just dealt with them. And uh, it's, this is our neck of the woods. This is our territory. And something significant. When I said that the title of this message is The Signs of the Times, it's because I believe that we're actually seeing a significant season and time for the church. And I want to give you some of the signs of the way God opened this up. Two and a half years, he says, I'm opening a door that no man can shut. At that time, we had people in here who found us supernaturally because for the 12 years that we did traveling ministry, God says you will never mark it you will never ask to speak somewhere. You will never, that my system for you to be made known is divine appointments. And you know, you can't, you can't orchestrate divine appointments, so that makes you trust God. And make a long story short, a pastor up in New England was letting some of his local pastors teach in his school, and then he would give a token $25. They were already pastoring in the area. They were just coming and doing a class. And here we are in Charlie says, will you come up to West Haven, Connecticut and do a class for me four for four months? Oh, uh, oh, yeah, there's a $25 honorarium. <laughs> and, I, and, and the Spirit of God came on me, and we said, yes, 
we went up. There was a, a, an apartment provided for us. Uh, we had, a, what was it, a Tuesday school class in his uh, Bible school, and $25. And I said, oh, M-G, how do we do this? And then no matter where we turned, we would find effective ministry would go to maybe out of 30 people, there'd be one that would just be significantly ministered to. Most of the time, the Spirit would point them out in the midst. May do that this morning. And we would pray and find out, that's a pastor's wife. You've got to come to my husband's church. And we worked seven days a week, seven days a week, house groups, one-on-one -on -one appointments, and churches, seven days a week, without ever advertising, word of mouth. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, some of you know um, that we had people say, gee, wherever, uh, wherever we go in New England, we hear about Dennis and Jennifer, and that word of mouth is what passed it on to different people. And they said, who are they? Well, I think I'll have them come to my church. Well, I think I'll do this. Or we would minister to somebody. It was the church secretary at some other church and what have you. But it was so beautiful to watch God do it and not man. That's the part I still, to this day, like more than anything. Well, we, in Charlotte here, when we planted this church, it was a reverse miracle. You ever had a reverse miracle in your life? A reverse miracle was the opposite of what happened in New England in the traveling ministry came here. Here, if we made a friend, they'd move out of town. So you don't want to make friends with Dennis Jennifer, they might move out of town. But that's changed since then. But for years, we were here going, why are we here? And God basically said, for your relocation. I'm going, well, Again, that doesn't answer my question. Why are we here if we're going to relocate? Why do I work in New England and live in Charlotte? Was the question. And Jennifer, being a Southern girl, Florida girl, she said, God's really confused. He sends us to the north in the winter and brings us back here for the summer. She says, Southerners don't do that. God has made a mistake, but he never answered her. On that. She never did get an answer. She'll have to go to wait till she's in heaven to find out why he did that. But I'm saying all this, that the divine appointments is taking place. What God really wants out of each and every one of you is obedience. Your clever plans, you can just put them on the shelf because he will do it whatever way he wants to. And if you obey him and humbly walk with your God, he will bless every step that you take, whether it makes a lot of sense or not. He said, I want this to be a prototype of what you were doing in other people's churches. Because in other people's churches, that's not your jurisdiction. And I want you to have a prototype of a people who were not a people, who became a people, who could walk in a forgiveness lifestyle and be prepared for the unity that I'm about to bring to the church at large. It's a preparation of the bride. And so, the without, I'm saying a lot of stuff that I used to keep to myself, but I just feel like this is the season to let you know what's going on behind the scenes and what, how God manifests it. Uh, in my prayer time, when we came here and we were in obscurity. Nobody even knew this building exists. Most still don't know. And all the churches we went to in New England, most of them don't even know we have a church here. <laughs> they know us from the traveling ministry, full stature ministries. They have no idea there's a kingdom like church. Then God in our prayer time said, this is uh, a few years ago. It says, I want you to be a neighbor, that was the word he gave me, and a friend to Morningstar. And then later he said the same thing when Sid Roth uh, changed his location from Georgia to here in Charlotte. Not that other people aren't worthy of friendship or being neighborly, but those are the only two he laid on my heart and that was privately. So Jennifer went and taught at the Oak Initiative shortly after God said that. And I said, we can't take an honorarium because even though that's what we did for a living in other churches, I said, Sid Roth and Morningstar were to be friends and that we were to have a relationship that was non-financial, just heart to heart, because God wanted to do something bigger than any one ministry. 
And, but I didn't tell nobody that except them, you know, when the time comes. Because God says, I want you to be a resource to other ministries. Now, it may very well expand. I'm sure it will expand beyond that, but that's the only instruction I had. And that was private, and I didn't say nothing. All of a sudden, after that commitment, Jennifer gets asked to do the Oak Initiative. After that, we got asked to do the school, and we taught the children's books in the school. After that, and of which we wouldn't take nothing for it, and it was a, a friendship covenant that you do in your heart whether anybody knows it or not. It's an attitude of the heart, and I believe this is what God's looking for in the body. And then with Sid Roth, too, uh, and which in what you want to call leisure time, which we don't have any because we don't really want any. Um, <laughs> we love what we do. Uh, we, we fellowship with uh, Sid Roth and his wife and got to be good friends. Matter of fact, uh, well, Sid doesn't call me his best friend, but, he, but his wife calls Jennifer her best friend. So I hang out with the best friend of the best friend anyway, uh, by way of Jennifer. And it was, isn't that interesting that God would speak that in private and then make it happen without any real initiation, without any marketing, without any in your face, here I am. And he's been continually doing that. And it's the sign of the time that I believe that God is going to do something. And in the process, we've got, as a result then uh, of some years ago, being invited onto the program. Uh, when we did the program, uh, Destiny Image called. Uh, Destiny Image is, we've got what? Uh, two ebooks that'll be out shortly. A third ebook that has turned into a book. They took 18 of my messages on peace and they're making a book on peace. 18 messages they had transcribed and they're putting it to order. And we already have Live Free, which came out in December. Uh, Deep Relief Now is being expanded and coming out in May. And I had friends that tried to get published. <laughs> and they sought us out to, to get our books and to expand them through the examples that we have in our CDs. And that's been happening. None of this did I even make an effort toward, okay? And this week... Um, we're also, there's a lot of other things in relationship to these two ministries, some of which I'm not going to get into. But in light of all that, yeah, I'm going to get to that. And in, in light of that, also we have the potential now when we were with Sid to have a weekly television program on the ISN, It's Supernatural Network. He went network. He's not... I don't know if you understand the difference because Sid Ross on uh, TBN, God TV, but now he's moving toward his own network. And he asked if we would teach on, in his school and also have a start with a half hour weekly program of our own. Probably called the Den and Jen. <laughs> I don't know. We haven't, I haven't gotten that far because the criteria is is the funny thing is, is there's people replicating our material around the world, Australia, South Africa, England. They're replicating our material, but what they don't know is that we've got a base of about 60, 70 people to between the two uh, services, and I think we missed most of them today with the time change. <laughs> sleeping somewhere. If you're watching, you're in trouble. <laughs> but uh, in, the, in the midst of all of that, replication, what they don't understand, and I find it intriguing, is that with such a small volunteer base, it always reminded me of, I think it was Winston Churchill during the Second World War, said, never in the course of human events has so much been accomplished to so many by so few with such little, <laughs> okay? And so we've clearly, we're still a mom and pop shop, but yet the potential for the future is tremendous. Destiny Image, we've got two ebooks: how to he the keys to healing rejection, the keys to healing loneliness, um, the Jennifer's uh, uh, teaching on the physiology of everything that I taught her in the way of the supernatural exchange and, and that she documented and matched 
the physiology behind it. And so that book is, a, is just being submitted now. The Peace Book will be finished by, uh, at least their editing will be finished by the end of March. I mean, there is an open door that no man can shut. And it's not the kind of doors you knock down. It's something that God is sovereignly doing. But he's promising that, that this is not the day of the big names or the, or the Joe Heavy speakers. This is the day of the saints. And so that means that if you're even within the hearing of this ear, this is a threshold that you can cross individually and enter into what I believe is the perfect timing of God for a supernatural visitation as he prepares the bride. I believe we're preparing for an awakening beyond a shadow of doubt. Now, why am I saying this today? I'm sharing a lot of stuff that I normally don't share uh, from the pulpit, but I want the Ustream audience as well. Um, that, that basically are watching various countries and everything to know you can pray and participate in this at some level. Uh, matter of fact, you can participate in a financial level, except we'd never ask for money, but uh, <laughs> it would help. Uh, to qualify for the television program, we do have to upgrade to a higher standard than uh, this, this camera is, is high def. It's, they tell me it's better than the camera that's currently used in many places, but we're going to need two cameras and, <laughs> and a backdrop other than what you see up here. And these things will be taken. And it must meet the, the criteria, which uh, Jason and Cliff said is feasible, to meet the new criteria for the upgrade um, for the weekly program. And then the teaching on SID school, in SID school, it will be, and I love this part, all of those modules that I'm, I won't sell them because I want to know that the people caught it, but always wanted to have a video school because the people from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, they can't just fly down here, take the module for you know so many times and then come back for module two and then come back for module three, that basically those would belong to uh, Sid Ross ministry and to the school because it wants, really wants programming where nobody asks for money that Christian television is not as popular as it used to be simply because of fundraising and unfortunately a necessary part of TV airtime. But what we would do is have the opportunity to sell our product and put our website uh, on it. And uh, as long as you don't petition for money, then we can basically have a fresh Christian approach that goes around the world. He's already well connected. But this is big. This is big. When you go network, it's big, and it's a privilege and an honor. And again, uh, it was just, it's the season and the time we're in. So pay attention, because I think you're on the threshold of, of something really big. Now listen to this. An open door, a time of acceleration. I don't know if you're aware of it, but if, you're, if you stay in tune to what uh, the voice of the Lord in the body of Christ... There, we've been doing it for two and one half years, have never relinquished, God has never relinquished the impression on me that Isaiah 22, 22 is still happening. You might think things uh, ebb and flow, but every time you think it ebbs, something else opens up for replication and multiplication. And so uh, God's basically saying that this season that we're in is so significant that of acceleration, I preached all of this, but I'm preaching it to pretty much an audience that knows us already, but I believe it's bigger. And what really got my attention that now is the time to talk about some of this stuff is an email that I got that read my mail better than any prophet has ever done and we've been singled out, Jennifer and I, by Chuck Pierce, Denny Kramer, many, many of the, the bigger names, Jim Gall, whatever. And we've had wonderful words from them. But this one has a different spirit on it. This one tells me that the spirit that's on it is that it's an Issachar anointing to say, pay attention, people. This is the time that you're in. So are you ready? This is someone who doesn't come to our church. And he makes it real clear in the email that we're not high priority on his list. 
But listen to this. Dear Pastor Dennis and Dr. Jen, when I was praying this morning, the Holy Spirit showed me something that he wants to do in your church and your ministry, which is very interesting when it comes from outside, all right? I don't regularly pray for you. <laughs> so it was a surprise when I saw your faces. Those are the best prayers, by the way, when you're surprised. I saw a large door open over your fellowship, and when it opened, the whole sanctuary was filled with pure light. This was a door of awakening. Within the light, I could hear angels' voices, brilliant arrays of color and glory, and a warm spring wind that carried both rain and the scent of dew on it. The wind shook silver wind chimes that released a song of awakening that brought even more angels. It was the sound of the bride making herself ready. That's corporate. It was the, that makes me excited. If it's just about Dennis and Jennifer, it doesn't excite me, to be honest. It excites me that there's replication and that there's, uh, the day of the saints is emerging. The day of the priesthood of the believer is emerging. No more pew sitters, but, but uh, basically uh, people that are actively engaged in the work of the ministry. As soon as the door opened, the whole room became filled with a manifestation of great glory and love. It was literally heaven on earth. The room I saw became a garden of delights in which the Father was pleased to walk with each one of his children in the cool of the day. As glorious as everything smelled and sounded and looked, it was the total love of the Father that actually caused the garden to grow. It became filled with sweet flowers, fragrances, and fruit. This also is the day to spring forward, as in daylight savings time, of which half my people are sleeping. Wake up. I can hear him now saying, I'm watching, I'm watching. No, get here. <laughs> I, I want to be here in the time of visitation. I want to be here for what God is preparing for them that love him. The Lord says that now is the time of your ministry and your fellowship to spring forward. And you are coming into a season of accelerated blessing today. That's interesting. Today. Daylight savings time. Today. You have done much plowing and sown much seed. However, the season is here when the Father is going to bless all that you've done with a warm spring wind and rain from heaven. I also saw your hearts wondering in this season if this season would end. But every time I had this, you have this thought. I'm, I'm basically, every time I've had this thought, something else happens. Every time I rest in the fact that we're little, Every time I do that, something else happens. I think God likes to do things in obscurity, and he likes to use, he just likes to do that. And it says, you have done much plowing, sown much seed. However, the season is here where the Father is going to bless all that you have done with the warm spring wind and the rain from heaven. I also saw your hearts wondering if this season would ever end. Every time you had this thought, the warm spring wind would actually increase. This is because the wind is the wind of his love and glory, and it is now the appointed time to awaken the bride. Now, he got my attention so much because of... I can read a text message and tell what kind of spirit's on it, regardless of the content. And I can read a book and tell basically where the heart, and it's not bragging, this is just the way I'm wired. I can tell what was the heart of the writer, that even if the words were good, I can tell when they were angry, when they were a little upset when they wrote it. And I could tell that this guy had no agenda but sim other than the obedience of God to give it to me. So, plus I can feel the quality on it. And so, 
I, uh, he said, uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions. <laughs> so we emailed him and said, call me. And I talked to him on the phone. I wanted to feel his spirit. And he called on the phone. He filled in all the gaps. It's better than this email. He even zeroed in on certain people. And he had insights onto uh, some other issues. So I'm going to make him put, put his presence where his word is. And so next Sunday, he's going to come and explain in between the lines a little bit to us. So we'll see if he has anything to add to that. So he says, yeah, after the prayer, he says, I thought about finding out where you were anyway. Uh, he says, I mean, let's face it, he says, I don't regularly pray for you. Uh, and so he was surprised when he saw our faces. Well, I'm surprised too. And so what I believe God is doing is that it's a time for acceleration for the church. And it's time, the part that really interested me was that was private between me and Sid Roth Ministries. It's not private now, I'm saying it on your stream. Uh, Sid Roth Ministries and Morningstar to just be a friend and a neighbor and to never, never, never charge any, uh, probably shouldn't be saying all of this because then I'll be getting overloaded with stuff. But anyway, between us, it was just a friendship neighbor thing. And he said, this guy said that he felt that the word was that God is putting the bride together and it's too big for one ministry. Which is very, makes it common sense. That if people had healthy relationships, you could accomplish things that nobody could accomplish by themselves, no matter whether you're big or small. There are certain things you can't accomplish by yourself. That if there is a corporate anointing in a congregation, how beautiful would a corporate anointing be in a family of relationships where the, the danger is in churches in the city and what have you is too many have an agenda for self-promotion and that will keep that kind of unity from really happening. But if God can, can network under the surface out of the attitude of the heart, then he can accomplish something that man can never put together because one thing you cannot, that you cannot uh, uh, overcome and that is a clean pure heart that uh, out of it will flow the issues of life and it will connect with those of like issues and so there's a bunch of other things that I don't feel at liberty to say but it's God is putting something together in a very very beautiful way and if you feel sometimes like you're unimportant or obscure as a matter of fact uh, it's, it's not in print anymore, but I published a book when I was a very young Christian just on my testimony because there were so many miraculous things happened between my salvation and Holy Spirit baptism. But I can remember what I put on the front page. It, this book is for the little people, the people who may feel in their heart that they may never really amount to anything from the world standards, but from God's standards, you're special, you're unique, and you're full of real purpose that does matter. And I believe that that's what God's gonna do. The world has already learned that self-esteem is meaningless. Secular psychologists have already proven that all that emphasis they put on self-esteem produced nothing. That they would have been better off training our young people in the schools of higher education to rather accomplish something with your life than be special because all we've done with the be special has made them enter into an entitlement mentality and miss the specialness of which they really were knowing who their father God is and how that they're a child of God. Therein lies your true identity. And in that identity, there is a destiny. And I believe that we're destined for that destiny and God is gonna bring it to pass. So this is kind of a, not a sermon this morning. This is more of a state of the state of the church address. But I want to really endeavor to encourage you to healthy relationships that are divine appointments and to never minimize it. I've seen people that were upset with a particular person and that particular person was the one that got them their next job. 
So there's nothing in life that can prevent you from entering into the fullness of the blessing that God has like your attitude. <laughs> your attitude will determine your performance. So if your attitude is right, you can be like Mr. Magoo. You can be blind to everything and you just everywhere you go, it works. <laughs> and you stay out of trouble. The path of the righteous shines like the noonday sun. And that's what I want for you. But because I'm a how-to person, the scriptures that we were getting in our prayer time uh, was about how love and truth are meeting in the street. That's the message translation, Psalm 85.10 in the message. Love and truth are meeting in the street. Right living and whole living are embracing and kissing. I really believe that what we are in right now is a manifestation of a supernatural experience that I had 38 years ago. It's almost like Jesus saying, today this scripture is fulfilled in my hearing for sure. And that was when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. There was one particular verse of scripture, and I'm not exaggerating. It was a living Bible, Hosea 3.5. I was troubled in my spirit and grieved that intelligent people, I was looking at a magazine in my mom's magazine rack, just reading the cover. I got grieved in the spirit, and this is when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, because it was a Psychology Today magazine. And on the cover, it was doctors, lawyers, firemen, Indian chiefs, I don't know, but they were all going to the Arizona desert to get on a spaceship to go to the Father's kingdom. I think they were UFO children or something like that was the article. And, I'm, and I got so grieved on the inside. I'd been saved about four months, but I had not been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I got grieved, and it was the first time I felt a feeling. Because up until then, those first four months I was saved, I just knew it was the right way to live, but that was it. No revelations, no nothing, just a deep assurance that this is the way we're supposed to live. But then I got grieved, and I felt that grief, and I went, God, how could intelligent people be so deceived? And I walked over, and there was a living Bible that I had gotten into the house. It was my parents' house. And I opened the Bible, and Hosea 3.5 in the living Bible now pay attention, I'm saying this, this has really happened. <laughs> it came off the page in the air, and it had life. And I read it with my mind, but I read it, I could tell I was reading it with my being, so to speak. Hosea 3.5 in the Living Bible, when I was troubled at the deception of the people and of their futile search for something, God says, afterwards, afterwards, they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King, and they shall come trembling and submissive to the Lord and His goodness in the end times. And it was the goodness of the Lord that'll lead you to a better level of repentance than anything else. And God's been so good to me that I'll tell you what, I don't think I... I don't think I could Im improve any more on gratitude except to repent. I don't know how to be more grateful or thankful that God says basically in Micah 6, 8, I have showed thee, O man, what the Lord requires. Do justly, love mercy, and then walk humbly with your God. Walking humbly with your God is nothing more than obedience to what he says and dying to your own ideas no matter how grand or, uh, or, or no matter how great they may seem. Die to your own ideas and let God do the implementation. Even if it's a God idea, let him do the timing and the means. The means are important. And afterwards, they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah, their King, and they shall come trembling and submissive to the Lord in the end times. Now is the time where I believe that scripture that manifested to me 38 years ago is coming to pass. Afterwards, after they get done sick and tired of, of, of trying to find fulfillment in life and failing to put, I'm talking believers even, tired of putting Jesus on equal level with Jesus, I love Jesus, I love my family, I love my car, I love my job, I love my boat or whatever, I love my dog. 
The problem is not that they don't love Jesus, but they're, they're, they have scattered charms. They have too many loves and too many lovers. And they're putting them on even keel and do not know and are not aware in their heart that Jesus Christ is not Lord. And God is saying that in this day we're entering and crossing a threshold. We're going to train people on how to make Jesus Lord. How to make Jesus Lord. Proclamation that Jesus should be Lord has always been in the church. How to make him Lord and saying he's Lord is two different things. Because we know that the acid test comes when someone are going to say, Lord, Lord, did, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out devils? And he said, depart from me, I knew you not. Because the fear of intimacy and the lack of placing him first place. We have many loves, but I'll tell you what, if you love Jesus as much as you love your family, you're, you're, you're off track. You're to love Jesus more than your family. He demonstrated his love for you that while he was a sinner, he didn't send a committee. The Greeks would have sent a committee. A Hebrew sent a son relationship. He said, I want you to demonstrate my love because it's a relational love. And I believe we're entering into that. The problem in Hosea, we're we're in the season of Hosea, is really what I'm saying. That's the Issachar time we're in. And if you're familiar with the book of Hosea, that's basically a picture of it. That and the Song of Solomon. Because the problem in Hosea was, Hosea 4.1 says, here's the problem. Sacrifice doesn't fill the gap. Sacrifice is not what he wants. He wants, I've given you a capacity to hear and obey. I want you to obey. Obedience is better than sacrifice. He says there's no truth or mercy or intimate knowledge of God in the land. There's a lot of head knowledge, but there's no real truth and mercy. Truth and mercy are not kissing together. Uh, Micah 6, 8 where it says you shall do justly love mercy. I believe that until Jesus, until you're walking humbly with your God, Listen to me because you're doing this. Christians are doing this. If you're listening by Ustream, you, you can very easily be guilty of this and not even know. You can love justice and do some occasional mercy. That is the opposite of the tenor of spirit that God wants to bless. You know what I mean by the tenor of spirit? I mean like a tuning fork. Does it vibrate justice and then some mercy? Or does it vibrate love for mercy and then some justice that's done out of mercy. There's a, there's a tenor of the spirit that God's looking for and it's to walk humbly with your God. You'll have the right to love justice, do mercy. That's basically the love commandment in the Old Testament, Micah 6, 8. I have showed the old man what does the Lord require to do justice, to do justly, love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. What does that mean? Do justice, love mercy. That means... I'm just speaking the truth in love, brother. Okay? Most of the time, you'd rather be right than happy. Right? (laughs) And right people sometimes are not happy. So, uh, (laughs) righteousness and right standing with God is a beautiful thing, and you want to be righteous, but you want to balance that with love. Judgment is often necessary if you're going to keep your heart purified and clean. Judgment's necessary, but forgiveness needs to be a lifestyle. To challenge and confront, but what about reconcile and heal? You have to lean toward one more than the other to to walk in that scripture, to do just the love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. There's a place to divide and separate. Even the table of the Lord does that. Judas went out and it was dark. The rest of them went to Olivet, the place of illumination and further insight. So yes, it's a place to where you may have to divide. Divisions must come even in a church so that those that are approved might be made manifest and rise to the surface. But the love of God says, I'm more concerned and more focused on putting together than I am dividing. You can hate sin and your love for justice, but you gotta love the sinner. And if you can't separate that out, you're going to be a better judge than a lover. There's a time to require justice, but there's also a time to go the second mile, not a popular disposition of the heart. So I believe that God's saying, I'm, I'm, prophets, 
that are stating the truth arrogantly are not going to be effective. But God is going to be wanting us to represent him in the same heart attitude that he has, like ambassadors. An ambassador was not just to convey the message. The ambassador was to even act out the proper attitude that was given to him when he was given the instruction. If the king were to tell the ambassador, you tell them to change, then he better go and say, you people better change. You better do it with the same attitude, the same tone, not just the right words. So, in light of all that God's doing, I believe that there is an open door that no man can shut, and I'd really encourage all of you to walk through it. Find out what God's doing in your life and be part of it. But I know you love your family, you love your car, you love your boat, you love your house, you love your job. Well, maybe not your job, but you love those other things. All right. It has to get to the place where he's preeminent. Jesus wants to be first and foremost. All those other things are secondary no matter how good they are. And so here's the how-to. Because I'm a how-to person, I believe that God has given us kind of a plan for the days ahead. Here's what he's going to do. Say, how, how do I submit to a message like this? Okay, I understand the message with my head, but in my heart, how do I apply this? I believe he gave us a lesson in Homer. Uh, in, in, in Hosea, uh, not Homer, that's the I- Iliad, all right? Just checking to see if you're paying attention, okay? But here it is, Hosea chapter 2, in two verses of Scripture, I see a how-to of application that the Spirit of God's going to work in our lives in the days ahead, um, And by the way, uh, if you're visiting, uh, come back next Sunday and listen to that young man. We're going to put him on the spot. He gave part of this word anyway. He needs to be made accountable. (laughs) And then to be here and all the prophets will judge. Okay. All right. Verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness, and I will speak comfort to her. I will give her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor as a door of hope. And I believe just in that little frame, it's one thing to know what God says. It's another thing to know what he does. But to me, the most beautiful thing in the kingdom is to know the ways of God. The children of Israel saw the acts of God, but Moses knew his ways. That is, there's biblical literacy throughout the body of Christ, but application of knowledge is where the real key needs to be. And so the how-tos are what we want to pursue. We want to pursue the application. And I believe this is the application God gave us for the days ahead. So picture yourself in this. Personalize it. Make it, own it. Make it your own. But to be where God wants you to be with the attitude of love and truth meeting in the street, right living and whole living, embracing and kissing each other. That's what needs to happen inside you. Right living and whole living, kissing each other on the inside. Psalm 85.10. But in verse 14 and 16, Hosea 2, there are, there's five principles in here that I think are significant. And so let's put ourselves in this place that even if you feel like you're on top of it, you drifted in some capacity, somehow, somewhere by the sidetracks of life. So first of all, this is what God says. I will allure her. That means that cords of love, he's drawing each and every one of us. Have you seen cords of love drawing you in any direction? Have you seen an obedient response in your life that you felt drawn? So you just said, oh, what have I got to lose? I'll I'll, I'll go, I'll see, I'll I'll try, I'll, I'll endeavor. He's drawing you with cords of love. These cords of love can be resisted, though, can't they? But these cords of love are drawing you to himself. That's the first key. I believe in the days ahead, he's bringing sons and daughters from afar. He's even bringing sons and daughters for us to replicate even what we've been teaching. And it's all over the world. There's a group in Australia. There's a a group in Spartanburg. There's a group in... uh, um, 
some suburb of Atlanta, uh, and they're reproducing this and they're having tremendous success. And they're, they're bigger than we are as a church. And it's, it's exciting to know that these groups are happening all over the world. But there is a contagion, a, a healthy, holy contagion for the purposes of God and for meaning in life. People are tapping into their destiny and say, this is why I was made. This is in my DNA to reproduce according to kind. And God is right now drawing with cords of love that can be resisted, but that's his first step. He very gently draws. And when it says the second step, I'm going to bring you into the wilderness. Listen, bringing you into the wilderness just like he did here was not for the purpose of punishment. He was bringing her into the wilderness for intimacy. It was to bring her into a place where you and I can be alone and I can be first place in your life and all these other lovers of yours are going to drift away. If God is going to give you opportunity to do that in your prayer time, do it. There are a lot of good things in your life that are not God. And the sooner you realize that, good things are not necessarily God when they're on equal level with God. I was raised in charismatic days and I was anti, anti um, rules, regulations. I was anti legalism. I was anti and I still am. But I also see a, a lackadaisical attitude in the body of Christ that needs to shift back into responsible Christian living. And that includes tithing, attendance, all those things that we would like to call legalism, all right? But in reality, it's a, it, it reveals the heart, and that's really what God wants. And so uh, I see that God's saying, if I'm going to allure you, step one, and step two of the process, I'm going to bring you into a place to where it's just me and you. That's where I do my best work, when it's just me and you. And I'm going to bring you into this wilderness for privacy, not punishment. I'm bringing you alone for the purpose of intimacy. You know, one of the best things that happened is I had all my pastoral support system pastors that I had known for years, met with on a weekly basis for 20 years. When God sent me to Charlotte, I didn't have a relative. I didn't have a phone number. I didn't have an address. I had nobody. But you know what I had? I had God so supernatural. Because you know what? As spiritual as I thought I was, when you have a lot of other things, you lean on those other things without even knowing it. He brought me here. Strangers would roll down their window and say, God had me sit in this car because someone was going to ask me directions, and I was, I was the one looking to ask directions. God provided a condo in Tiga K for me, for one dollar, fully furnished, uh, I think it was about twelve hundred dollars a month for that furnished uh, apartment. One dollar by a total stranger, supernaturally. One of the men uh, that was John Holcomb, over at Morningstar one time says he just shook his head. He says, "You know, I hear people say God sent me to Charlotte all the time, and then they, the bottom falls out. They struggle. Nothing works." He says, you come, and you're living like a king over there in Tiga K. God tells you to come to Charlotte, and everything you touch works. And yes, and I sat, and I cried, and tears of repentance because of the goodness of God. That is coming. That was a prototype of what he's going to do for the church. And he's going to do it right here, but he's going to do it in other places if your heart is open to relationship and to a family bigger than yours. Bless us for no more is going to die in the church. That is not stewardship. Your children is not your only ministry. If you see your children as your only, any pagan can do that. Love them that love you back. I'm not against you loving your children. I'm simply saying God's got a purpose that you better expand beyond that. If that's your only priority in life, you're missing life. Afterwards, the children of Israel shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King, and they shall come trembling and submissive. I sat with a Greek scholar when I was six months old in the Lord, a, 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 a retired Presbyterian minister, and I sat with him and I said, he says, Dennis, what did the Lord show you in that scripture? And I said, well, I don't know what it means in the original Greek, but I know this, that trembling and submissive uh, Hebrew, I'm sorry. I said, well, he was a Hebrew and Greek scholar. I said, um, 
All I know is that trembling and that submissive was not a fear of God in the sense they were afraid of God. They were overwhelmed with his goodness and they were awestruck with honor and reverence. Yes, honor and reverence, but the trembling, the trembling, of course, this is a living Bible paraphrased anyway, but I said the trembling part, I said at the goodness of God because I, my whole body shook at the goodness of God and the way he was to me when I didn't feel like I deserved it. And quite frankly, Deserving it doesn't really enter into the picture. The goodness of God is so magnified beyond anything that we could ever do or think. And God basically started speaking and saying, I've got you here alone in Tiga K for the purpose of privacy, not punishment. To have you alone, to bring you into a realm of intimacy and the supernatural. I've also brought you here. The next step, I will speak comfort to her. This is also the place where God says, I'm purifying your heart, Dennis. I'm getting rid of the dross. You're crying at my goodness toward you, but I'm cleansing you at the same time. I'm bringing you into a place of healing. But this healing comes in three stages. First of all, I'm dealing with you. That's the part that usually doesn't feel good momentarily. I'm dealing with you. But as I'm, as I'm dealing with you, I'm also bringing healing. After the healing, I'm putting you back together again that you might function even more effectively. I'm not there to punish you or to destroy you. I'm there to purify. I believe he's doing this to the church right now. And this is the process. There will be those that will react to the healing. Because some people, believe it or not, Christians will avoid pain at all costs. They will avoid that. We, we, we put it in the front of all the children's books. We've taught them, listen prophetic people, we've taught them how to speak, we've taught them how to act, but until now, we haven't taught them what to do with their emotions. And yet even the the major breakthroughs in science and physiology show the emotions control your thinking and the emotions control your choices. And it actually explains Romans 7 better. The things I want to do, mind will, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those things I do. It's because the source is either the fruit of the spirit or your emotions. One of them is the motor. You're like a vehicle. Think of it like this. My mind is a steering wheel in life. My emotions are the motor. My will is like the... um, I used to say standard transmission and clutch, but we can't use that because most people don't even know what that is anymore. All right, that's that's your transmission where you pull it from. Your will is like pulling it from neutral to drive. You engage and you choose. But if that motor isn't running, you can sit in the car and turn the wheel all you want like a little child and you can switch the gears all you want, drive, reverse it, you ain't going anywhere. That's exactly the way the will, the mind, and the emotions work. You must deal with the source, the power source. If you don't deal with the motor, you're not going anywhere. Your mind could be racing and you could be turning the steering wheel and going all different subjects, but you're not accomplishing anything. And then if you do engage and you don't have your motor on, everything you're engaging, you're being led around by the prince of the power of the air. Whether you think you're doing your own thing or not, he's leading and directing you. So God's basically saying, I'm going to take the church and I'm going to reveal, then I'm going to deal, and then I'm going to heal. And he says, I'm going to speak comfort to her and purify her heart. Do you remember Elijah? Believe it or not, after running from Jezebel, going into depression, God spoke comfort to him and strengthened them back. He's going to do that to the church because we've got a wounded body. We have biblical literacy and high gifting with emotional wounding. And the downside to that is, Spiritual maturity and emotional maturity are synonymous. Almost perfectly synonymous. If you don't grow emotionally and get the rule of Jesus over those emotions, you aren't as mature as you think you are. And you have no right to even suppress your emotions and say, I don't want to feel, I don't like those yucky feelings. You don't have a right 
to keep anything from Christ. You said you were bought with a price. I am not my own. Your emotions belong to God as much as your, your, your mind and your will for him to be Lord. He needs all three. He needs to be Lord over all three. So he's going to deal with the church, but he's going to speak comfort to her because when he does heal, it brings peace. It brings a supernatural comfort that defies negative circumstances and negative relationships. When peace rules, God rules, and you can go into a hostile environment and be triumphant because peace will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. The fourth element. I'm going to give her vineyards. Basically, God is going to give you an opportunity to do something with your life. Now, for the poor attendance, the no tithing, and I don't do anything in the church, <laughs> it's probably going to stand out like a sore thumb because God is going to look for those, he's going to give you something to do because he wants to reestablish trust. Think of all the multitudes in the church. 46% born-again Christians don't go to church anymore. 46%. They got wounded in the house of God. But if God shows you how to get healed from those wounds, it's time to get back in. And when you get back in, it's time to participate. Now, I watch church work people to death. I'm not one of those. I saw take new believers and just work them to death until they, they backslid. But I'm saying he'll give you something to do to love you and to give you a sense that I want you to reestablish trust in God and his body at the same time. That's the purpose of doing something. I once had a friend that, that uh, really, really uh, fell off the wagon in church, so to speak. And I watched my spiritual father restore him. And I said, very few restore properly. Most of the time, they just say, sit. And if you sit long enough, you'll be okay. Uh, I've seen kids sit in timeout box, and they went in rebellion, and they came out of the timeout box in rebellion. It, sitting didn't heal anything. But I saw my spiritual father say, he's not leading worship, but he's clearly repentant but he needs a season to where we reestablish trust in him as he reestablishes trust in God and himself. He said, put him, in the, put him in the choir. In his church, they had a choir as well as a worship team. And I saw the wisdom in giving them something to do. I believe this is God's, God's going to give people opportunities to do something. And that doing something is not the significance of what exactly it is. I had people that wouldn't do anything unless it was great. <laughs> you know? Well, that, that, it, it's, that's not what God's looking for. God's looking for an attitude of the heart whether anybody sees you, what you do or not. But he's going to lead you to do something so that you reestablish trust, not just so much in God, but God is going to show you that he trusts you again and that you begin to open up that damaged, wounded heart toward the rest of the body where you got hurt in the house. And God's going to give a beautiful opportunity for restoration and transformation. And I really believe this is how he's going to do it in a, in a general kind of way. We're all unique. We're all special. He can do it any way he wants to. It's the one thing you learn about healing is he can do it. There's no rules. He can do it any way he wants. But this is a pattern of the way I've known God to work in my life and in other people's lives. And it's, it's a how-to of relationship. It's the way relationship works. And so then he says, after I comfort you, I will give you something to do to reestablish trust. But here's the most beautiful part. By the way, this is the part where we advance. This is where this church is right now. This is where I am right now. I don't know about those other processes. I may have to cycle through them again myself just like everyone else does at, at different levels. But the last step is, and I will make your door of trouble your door of acor, a door of hope. It's going to be the place of blessing. In my own life, much of what I teach, they go, wow, he knows a lot of stuff about sex. Yeah, that's because I've had failures in that area, and I had to learn what not to do, and then how to fix it, and then how to redeem it. 
All right. Oh, he knows, he knows a lot about discernment. Yeah, because I made a lot of bad choices. And I went, oh, I ain't going to do that again. Next time I feel that, I'm not doing that. So then you learn a lot about discernment. Your, your compost pile of errors and mistakes can become the beautiful garden in which God wants to breathe that breath, that spring. He mentioned that three times, I think, in that uh, email about the, the, the fresh wind. I was just studying in my prayer time the north wind of discipline and the, and the east wind of this and the south wind and the west wind and all its indication. And I just believe that this is, this is the wind of blessing that's coming upon us and that uh, it's the summer the summer wind and it's the wind of blessing but your valley of trouble will be a door of hope that place where you had previous trouble could become your greatest anointing don't you like that idea if rejection which was my biggest area of life I felt like a walking pin cushion I don't care where I went or who I was with they were picking on me I was a victim and when God healed me, it's like that is the strongest anointing is acceptance. That if somebody rejects me, I go, that's too bad. I'd have loved you anyway. Uh. <laughs> it's, that's as the honest response. It's like, I don't have nothing against you. So apparently it's your issue. I could even help you with that if you wanted to. Not because I want you to like me, but because I want you to be better. I don't want you to walk around with your barbed wire poking people when it's really your barbed wire that's wrapped around you, that's bumping into other people's, in some cases, other people's barbed wire. <laughs> you know. So, let's pray this through. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I believe that these, this element and this time and this season, the sign of the time is that mercy and truth are coming together. They're meeting in the street. Right living and whole living are embracing and kissing. I believe that this is a time and a season when the sudden startling goodness of God is making its appearance in our lives. The sudden, st I want you to be startled by his goodness. It will lead you to a repentance like you've never known. The startling goodness of God. I open my heart that there is an open door in the heaven and over this church and over other churches and that we are going to become a family of something bigger than ourselves. I want to become part of something bigger than ourselves. Individually and even in our ministries, I want to be part of something bigger than my ministry. And Father, we just want to relate in covenant friendship one to another. And there will be divine appointments. I won't try to make this happen, but I will honor the divine appointments that God places in my life. I will not treat as coincidence the uh, happenings of the day and the people that I bump into, good, bad, and ugly. I am going to treat them as divine appointments to reveal something of the character and the nature of God, something of the proper response that I'm supposed to have to be obedient to you and to live for you and serve you all the days of our lives. I believe you're going to draw us with cords of love. You're bringing us into a place of intimacy with you, deeper and fuller than anything we have before. You desiring preeminence. God, teach me to make you Lord. Teach me to make you supreme and preeminent in my life. If I haven't done so, I'm asking right now to reveal into me the things that I need to hold more loosely and the, to, to run after you more fully and more completely. Because it says you're going to comfort me. You're going to speak words to me of comfort. That you are constantly drawing me into that place of intimacy for the purpose of dealing and healing the wounds in my heart. To give me the comfort that I might comfort others with that same comfort that you comforted me. And God, you're going to begin in the days ahead to give me opportunities to do something. And I don't seek great things for myself, but I seek to obey you. You don't want sacrifice. You don't want me burning myself out in activity but you want me to obey so those things that you place before me those opportunities of things to do I shall do them as unto the Lord to honor you whether anybody's aware that I'm doing it or not I choose I choose to be obedient and reestablish my confidence in you there's a whole lot of people watching by you stream right now that I believe that you're mad at God because he didn't come through when in reality you need to repent that of the failure was really on your part to not respond the way he wanted you to respond. Not for him to work for you, but he's waiting for you to work for him. For he knows the plans that he has for you. Plans for welfare, not calamity. 
God says, I'm going to guide I'm going to guide her and I'm going to give her something to do. And what was previously her worst nightmare, her place of trouble is going to open up and be a door of opportunity. And your greatest anointing will be that which was your greatest wounding. So Father, right now I present my heart to you and I receive forgiveness for having harbored wounds, knowingly or unknowingly, but I am opening the door of my heart. God's flinging open the door for him to make that door of trouble a new beginning and a place of anointing. If some of you are coming full circle in in certain areas, that doesn't mean necessarily geographically, but it means full circle in a a going around the mountain. Isn't it time that we turn that mountain into a molehill? Isn't it time we spoke to that mountain and said, be them removed? I don't want to go around that mountain again. So Father, right now, thank you. For this day, thank you that it's a time of acceleration and a time to spring forward. It's a time for the blessings of God. And right now, I want you to just soak in the healing that God's been manifesting lately. I want you to soak and open the door of your heart to Christ the healer. And if you're watching by Ustream, I want to pray for you as well. But I want you to yield right now. You know how to soak. You know that term. It's basically absorbing the presence of God from Christ in you. But I want you to soak with specificity and say right now, I yield to Christ the healer that lives in me. Let him rise with healing in his wings. Let him go to every cell in my physical body, every organ and every system. Every cell stays open to the healing virtue of God. And if you don't have a particular ailment in your body, I am opening the door to prosper and be in health. Even as my soul is prospering, I'm holding my heart open to continued health and healing. For I believe that part of what God is promising is health. Health and healing. And so, Father, we just thank you for the miracles of healing and the progressive healing. And we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. In your prayer time, I highly recommend in the days ahead, soak in Christ the healer. And then if you feel something negative rise up, find out what that emotion is and remove it. Receive forgiveness. Cleanse your heart and open so that there's no barriers to your physical healing because of emotional barriers. If there's something hindering, it'll rise up. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.